Thank you all for coming. So um, I'm going to be talking a bit about Modin and scaling pandas. Um, I guess this is my clicker. Um, so yeah, I'm Devin. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Ponder. Um, and we'll just jump right in here, uh, I hope. Good. OK. Um, so a little bit about me. I come from somewhat of a non-traditional background. Um, I was in the Marine Corps for four years um, as a Korean crypto linguist uh, from 2008 to 2012, and then after that, I went and got my, my bachelor's degree at the uh, University of Missouri. Um, from there, I went to Berkeley to work on my PhD, and I was very fortunate to get uh, a lot of support there, which kind of let me explore a lot of interesting problems. And, uh, you know, Modin, which is the, the main topic of this talk, started as my PhD project, and, and it really started from this, uh, this goal that I had of, of, of empowering scientists, empowering data scientists. Um, and now, of course, I'm the co-founder and CTO of Ponder. So the talk is about Modin, and um, I want to talk about how we built this, this data frame architecture from first principles. And, and so um, a fair warning, we get into some pretty deeply technical components. Hopefully, if I've, if I've done a good job in this talk, um, everybody will be able to take something from it. So um, you know, I talk about things at different levels and try to map to different things. You'll see, you'll see. So. Um, but yeah, so starting out, I kind of wanted to talk about uh, organizational problems in data science. And I don't think these are really talked about enough because uh, we like to talk about scale and, like, and, and how data teams don't scale. And, and everybody wants to think about the machine and how, how the machine doesn't scale. But I'm not actually going to focus on machine scalability in terms of this talk. I, I'm actually more interested in data teams. So uh, one of the big challenges these days is, is hiring. Everybody knows that, right? Um, but even beyond that, we've seen data teams uh, double in size, triple in size, and not actually end up providing more production models, not providing more, more production jobs, right? We're not seeing a lot of benefit from, from hiring all of these, all these additional folks, and it's, it's really caused a lot of bottlenecks. And so if we, if we kind of take a step back and take a look at what a lot of organizations look like um, when they're doing data science, what we see is that uh, often things start out in this uh, you know, laptop or workstation type environment where you're, you're prototyping with pandas and you're, you, know, you get new specs, new data, new, uh, new business requirements from somebody else, right? So, so you're kind of prototyping and then you hand it off. You hand it off to somebody else or maybe you rewrite it, uh, but you have to use a different tool if you want to run it in some testing or production environment. So there's a rewrite involved, you see there, and that, that takes time, human time, right? Talking about human scalability and, and human time is the limit here. And then when we look at production, um, you know, there's there's an additional rewrite. And some you know some companies skip testing and, and that sort of thing, or, or testing and, and production are are very kind of similar environments. Um, but all of this is to say that there's there's a lot of kind of rewriting that goes into data science and and, and trying to actually productionize something. And then, perhaps the worst of all, is when something goes wrong in production. You get feedback, or your, you know, your assumptions were incorrect, or there's a bug. Um, another rewrite. But this time, it has to go all the way back to the data scientist, because the, the initial assumptions were incorrect, or the, the sampling was, uh, the, you know, the data sample was, was tarnished in some way. So there's, there's just a lot of time that is put into each and every phase here. And, and often, it involves multiple people, and there are multiple points at which these folks have to have to kind of coordinate, and this is this is obviously extremely frustrating for data teams. It's frustrating for data scientists, it's frustrating for data engineers and machine learning engineers and software engineers. Everybody involved is really uh, really frustrated by this process because it just takes so much time, so much human time. And so the the data science scalability that that I want to talk about is actually this human scalability issue that we have, where we're not actually getting more out of more people. Uh, and, and a lot of this comes from this issue of, of having to constantly rewrite things. So uh, it, it's really easy to spin up more compute, right? Just give Amazon a million dollars and you can have as, as much compute as you want. But you can't do that with data scientists. It takes months to hire a data scientist, right? It, 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 takes, it, it takes a lot of time to, to ramp this person up and to get them to be productive on your team. So they're, they're Time is, is extremely, extremely valuable. So why is this? Why do we have things set up the way that we do, right? Why are, 
Why are, the, why are there so many phases of rewriting? Well, there's, there's this matrix, right? And there's, there's usability and there's performance slash scalability, right? So pandas, you, you may disagree with me here, but pandas is easy to use in that data scientists can take a boot camp, they can kind of get started almost immediately, and they don't need to have like a, like a super deep understanding of computer science fundamentals to actually go and be productive with pandas. That's not true if you want to use some big data tool, right? If you want to use a big data framework, you kind of have to understand cluster computing. You have to, you have to get an idea of, of what partitioning is and, and, and how, to, how to kind of split your data. You have to understand when things are executing and when they aren't. And so there are all these extra kind of cognitive overheads that we put on, on folks who, who, are, who are translating things to these big data frameworks. So, our goal, Ponder's goal, is to basically make data science tools work for the data scientists, right? And we, sh we shouldn't be having to, you know, try so hard and make and like work for our tools. The, the, the tools should actually be working for us. So, our 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 whole kind of goal is to transparently scale existing systems. And so we started with pandas. And Modin is our open source project um, that, you know, it, it scales pandas and it, and it allows you to run pandas on a variety of different execution engines, a variety of different databases. Um, and, and really what we're doing is we're abstracting away all these complicated details about how. Data scientists actually don't care about how, right? They, they just want to be able to, you know, submit their query. They want to be able to write, write things in a familiar language. It's, there's, there's nothing about distributed computing that kind of overlaps with their goals. So we want to abstract away all these details and, and just make, make them more powerful. This also has benefits for data engineers because now they, they don't have to be the ones to do this translation, right? So um, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but, but a lot of the, the kind of pull for Modin has actually come from data engineering teams who, who are saying, like, we've been working around pandas for years and, and we're tired of it. Please, please come and, and, and do this for us. So. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a bit. Um, and so where we, wanna, where we want Ponder to kind of fit is, is here at the top right, where, where we can build tools that are both usable and scalable, both easy to use and performant. So naturally, let's start from first principles. So this is where things will start to get a little bit more technical. I'll start at a high level, but um, a lot of this work started as my PhD work. And so, um, you know, we'll, we'll get into some theory, but, but we'll start at a high level. So don't be, don't be too worried. Before I start there, though, a lot of people, I see a lot of people say the Pandas API is not scalable. I think that's kind of a mistake to think, to think about things like that. Um, an API can't really be scalable. Is SQL scalable? It, it, it doesn't, you can, imp, you can have a scalable implementation of SQL. The Pandas API is just a way of expressing computation. And so when we, when we went after this problem from first principles, really what we wanted to do is, is take Pandas and, and say that it is just a way of expressing computation. We just need a way to kind of, you know, be able to express this in math and be able to optimize it and, and kind of abstract away all these details that you get for free when you're using SQL, right? So, um, so anyway, I just wanted to kind of preface with this because um, I, kind of, I kind of hear this a lot, so. Um, okay, so if we're, if we're solving data frames from first principles, this is kind of all the stuff we have to do. And you see implementation is last. Uh, naturally, we want to make sure that we know what a data frame is and that, and that we know what it can do first. Um, but we'll walk through these. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not gonna stick on this slide too long. So the first thing that we did was we formalized the data frame. And in formalizing the data frame, we wrote a paper uh, basically targeted at SQL users, database users, and database researchers, actually. And, and this was in VLDB 2020. Excuse me. Okay. Um, so we all love databases. We know what a database is. Um, we, we love the relational data model, right? It's simple. Uh, and it's, it's fairly ex ex expressive, excuse me. Um, I'm going to draw an analogy here to kind of 
restaurants. Um, so if we think about a relational database, we can really think about it as kind of a Michelin star restaurant where it has a uh, dress code. You can't just go in wearing what you want. You, you have a, a highly curated menu with a very select set of things that you can do, and it's highly optimized and, and does a, an excellent job at what it does, right? A Michelin star restaurant um, you know, is, is highly tuned food for uh, a subset of the menu. Now if we look at pandas, pandas is a lot more like a food court, if you will. So it's a different data model, different APIs. Um, there are over 600 APIs, and, and I'll get more into the details about like how, how we actually derive the data model in a little bit. But pandas, like I mentioned, is like a food court where there is no dress code. You can kind of do whatever you want. You can do something even a little bit unnatural, like get sushi and french fries together. So there's, there's no rules, effectively, to what you can do within the confines of, of that food court. So if we, if we kind of directly compare the relational database to a pandas data frame, um, on the kind of convenience side, what we have is we have this query this, this difference in how you actually express queries. So in SQL, you, of course, it's all or nothing. You kind of express your whole query up front, whereas with pandas, you're kind of incrementally building your query over time. Um, there's also a, a very strict schema that's enforced on the data. So you cannot, uh, you, you have to know the schema up front, and the schema is actually defined first. It's defined before you can even put any data into the database. In pandas, this is not the case. In pandas, you don't need to define a schema up front. It will actually infer the schema for you. It will determine the schema for you. Um, and then lastly, versatility. Um, pandas also kind of has an advantage here um, because really what you can do with SQL is select from where group I join, right? So um, pandas has a very expressive language over 600 functions of things that you can do. Um, now, this might sound like I'm telling you all to go use pandas. <laughs> if you don't like pandas, uh, you do not have to use pandas, trust me. But uh, there's a reason why people use pandas, and we will never get people to stop using pandas. So the best thing that we can do is try to rebuild this thing from the ground up. Naturally, everybody loves pandas, like I was mentioning. Um, so it's, it's often described as the reason for, for Python's popularity, the reason for Python's support. And it kind of was inherited over time. It, it, it was built in, in the community by a, by a large community. Um, so uh, for those of you who are kind of like computer science history buffs, uh, data, data frames actually first emerged in S, which was, which was uh, a language that was created in Bell Labs. And then um, R is the open source version of S. Um, you know, these are kind of a little bit more refined languages uh, for, for operating on the data frame. And then pandas, of course, kind of just went wild with trying to implement as many useful things as possible. Um, and, and I think that that really has contributed a lot to its success. So um, now let's jump into the, the kind of formalism. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not going to read this to you. I don't. Uh, if you're interested, please go read the paper. Uh, there, there's probably not even enough context on this page to, to really give the whole picture because um, we wrote a whole paper about it. So uh, please, if you're interested, you can talk to me afterwards as well. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk. Um, but in general, the, the data frame data model is, uh, it's an ordered data model. Um, so what that means is that it's, it's not necessarily sorted by any individual column or key, uh, but there is some kind of a semantic order to, to the data frame. It, and, and that order is actually used often in, in things like window functions and um, even in just debugging and, and, and printing out the data frame, the, the first five lines, right? Um, you know, this, this speaks to the kind of quick iteration that people, that people use pandas for. So um, there's also no predefined schema necessary. Uh, this is another big difference from from relational databases, you, you can induce the schema and infer the schema at, at runtime effectively. So um, that kind of explains why it emerged in like R and, and Python, which have runtime type errors that you know don't really pop up in, in compiled languages. So, um, so 
there's also this, this idea of named rows and columns. Um, you know, named rows and columns are, are useful for, you know, <laughs> moving metadata to data and data to metadata. Um, this row names has like traditionally been a kind of a controversial thing, but I, I don't think that row names are really, uh, you know, that special. It's just like a column that you can do a select statement on. It's, it's, it's not really all that, all that tricky. Um, and then there's also, you know, indexing by label or by name, so positional notation. Um, and that's where the order kind of comes from. So you can, I'm so clumsy, I'm sorry. Um, I knew this was gonna happen too, okay. I'm gonna put the cap back on. All right, all right, all right. Um, so, uh, so grabbing the kth row actually uh, means something, right? Or grabbing the first k rows actually means something. There's a, um, yeah, so, um, and then of course there's name notation, which is, uh, you know, indexing by that row's name or that column's name. Okay, so um, looking at this from two different perspectives, often it's really easy to kind of, it's, it's easier to compare this to like an existing data model. And this is where I'm starting to get into the weeds. And, and so, um, but I, I really wanted everyone to be able to take something from this talk. So um, from, from a relational data, for, or from, from a relational algebra perspective, um, you can kind of contrast data frames from the relational data model um, in the following ways. So uh, it's, it's basically ordered. Uh, relational tables are not, are not ordered. Um, it has named rows, which is, is not really a concept in, uh, in databases. Uh, a lazily induced schema, uh, this just wouldn't work on, uh, on a lot of databases. Um, column names of arbitrary type, this is because data can become metadata and, and, and vice versa. Um, and the, there's this column and row symmetry. So, um, you know, there's a transposability and, and you know, transpose by itself isn't, isn't really useful, but what it does unlock is, is really interesting things like pivots and, um, and, and those sorts of operations that are typically pretty tricky to do in, uh, in like a relational database. And of course, there's also like support for linear algebra operators like matrix multiply. So you can basically pass a pandas data frame to scikit-learn and it'll know It'll basically just rip off the labels and, and kind of handle it from there. Um, from the linear algebra side, we have, uh, it, it's a heterogeneous data model. So um, in, instead of like uh, being, being kind of one data type, um, it's, it's more of like a matrix-like data structure uh, because it does preserve that order in the same way that a, that, that a matrix does. Um, it also has both numeric and non-numeric types uh, and explicit row and column labels, of course, which uh, don't exist in the kind of matrix realm. Um, indexing, in addition to indexing by position, which you can do in a matrix, uh, you also can index by these labels. And then, of course, s support for like relational algebra operators like a join, which don't, don't really mean anything. And I'm gonna hit this like a thousand times, so. Oh, let's put it on the floor. Okay, all right, so now we have a data frame data model, okay? And it took us a while to get here, but, uh, Remember, we're trying to, to operate from first principles. We're trying to build this data frame from the ground up, really understand what it is and what we need to implement so we can start to scale Panda's workflows. So now that we have a data model, now we need to look at what a data frame can do. And so uh, our natural next step was to actually derive a, a data frame algebra and, um, and derive this from Pandas in a way that can allow us to express everything in Pandas in, in like, kind of a concise grammar. And, and so um, the, the challenge here though is that pandas is just enormous, like it's huge. This is, this is intractable really. Uh, it's taken a long time for them to kind of uh, develop pandas in this way and add all this functionality, right? So if me, a grad student, is trying to go and, and like scale pandas, there's no way that I'm ever gonna be able to catch up. So, uh, so this, this kind of algebra and this grammar had, had multiple functions. Uh, one of the functions was to be able to implement multiple of these operators at a time because there, there does happen to be a lot of uh, duplication in, in the Pandas API. So um, in, in short, here is what uh, the, the kind of algebra looks like, the, the mathematical representation of um, the, basically the data frame algebra. And what we can do with this math is we can start to think about how we can reorder things, how we can, uh, you know, take a query and, and really optimize it in, uh, in terms of, of 
order of operations. Um, and so you'll see here also that multiple APIs map to the same function. That's by design. Um, so in practice, there's, there's about 16 operators um, that, are, that it makes sense to implement. Uh, and as an algebra, you know, this is very expressive, but we kind of had to, you know, express beyond this in order to get, uh, you know, the optimal performance. So um, we also, like, I was getting my PhD, so of course you have to prove your work. <laughs> so uh, we did a proof by exhaustion. This was just a lot of, like, book work, kind of like hand writing work. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, we have a kind of a proof by exhaustion that, uh, that we can express all the Pandas APIs in, in this concise grammar, and now we have an algebra. And so the algebra actually, uh, you know, the, the next steps after the algebra is how do we parallelize this algebra, right? How do, we, how do we take these operators and make them run in parallel? And so uh, naturally the next step was a set of decomposition rules where we can take a data frame and split it up into smaller chunks and, and, and try to think about how, how we can run the, these things in parallel. Um, Parallelization is, of course, the, the kind of one of the more simple ways of, of getting an optimization uh, for, a, for, for any given query. And so the, the really interesting thing about data frame queries is that uh, they fall into three main camps. I mean, there are, there are a couple of others in, in addition to this around like joins and, and sorts and that sort of thing, but they fall into, into three main camps. This, the cell-wise operators, where you're kind of uh, anonymously applying a function across each cell individually. Um, that's a little more rare. Then there are these row-wise operators, and the row-wise operators are a, a, a lot similar to um, like your, your traditional SQL operators, excuse me. Okay, and then um, of course column-wise. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay, so we have three different ways of, of parallelizing operators. Um, and the tricky part about this is that you have to support all these in the same system. So you can't just naively go in and partition things across rows because the next operator may require you to partition things across columns. So you have to have a kind of an effective way of, of moving between rows, row, row parallelism and column parallelism, excuse me. So I promise I'm not trying to pad the runtime or anything of this talk. And, uh, this always seems to happen to me. Um, okay, and then of course a type system. I'm not gonna go into the details of these things, but we, we developed a type system and, and, and define the order semantics of, of every operator that we, that we have in the, in the algebra. And so now we have enough to kind of go and build an implementation. So, <clears throat> Since we have all this knowledge about what a data frame is, what a data frame can do, how we can parallelize this, how we can translate pandas down to this, to this algebra, we have all of this knowledge now. So now we can actually go and implement something. And so Modin is that implementation. Modin is the implementation that we, that we built uh, from first principles. And so it's, it's really easy to use. It was actually designed as a drop and replacement. Um, and, and we can be a drop and replacement because we we understand the Pandas API and how it maps to you know, our internal representation and our internal query language. So um, it's really easy to use, of course, and it's really, really easy to install. Uh, those are the, the two biggest challenges to getting people to use your stuff. So we wanted to make that as easy as possible. Um, and so we, I spent a lot of time on this formalism and, and hopefully you all take away something from that. But um, what I wanted to point out here is that there, we get a lot from that formalism, right? We get, we get a lot from understanding the data model. Pandas, Pandas has a certain feel to it that's hard to, to kind of mimic. Um, and so with this formalism, we can, we can get that feeling that you get from Pandas where you're really kind of controlling the data, but we don't have to bring along all the baggage of like having the, the physical implementation or the, having the physical order match the logical order, the user's preferred order, right? We can, we can decouple a lot of these things that, that are tightly coupled in pandas 
because we, because we have a good understanding of the data model, and because we spent a lot of this time on kind of drilling down and actually getting to the core of what a data frame is. Um, and on the algebra side, you know, of course there's a smaller surface to implement. I think that's, uh, that's a given, and I, and I already mentioned that. But another really interesting thing that we, that we can do is we can actually map these operators to other systems that have an implementation, like a, like a relational database, for example. And so uh, what we're building at Ponder is this idea of pandas on everything. Uh, and we can, we can express these pandas queries in our low-level programming language, uh, in our low-level algebra language, and then we can, we can either directly implement them on, uh, we can either directly implement them on a, uh, on a compute engine like Ray or Dask. We can, we can map them or push down queries to uh, a database, for example. And so we get a lot of, a lot of power from, from having this algebra because we can, we can actually express it in a variety of different languages. And so if you recall that this is how a lot of organizations look with all of the rewrites and all the time, how Modin is actually being used in practice is basically as this, this one layer where you implement things, you have that one API, and then everybody, we, we just basically, you, you flip a switch and it's automatically distributing your code underneath the hood. And so, you know, with this we've had a tremendous impact and I, I feel very fortunate that we have such a, such a strong community. Um, you know, we've, it's, it's really grown and it, it started as my PhD project, so I, f I feel very fortunate that I, I picked a, uh, I picked a, a challenging project, but, but also that I was able to, you know, build this community. Um, yeah, and so, um, yeah, if you're a user of Modin, I'd love to hear from you. Um, so I wanted to talk, I wanted to kind of drill down on a couple of case studies um, that, that kind of come from our community. Um, and one of them is this, uh, this e-commerce company that um, basically everybody runs into Panda's problems at, at some point, right? And so um, these folks were able to basically uh, drop in Modin just replace the import statement and process 1,000x the data faster than they were with pandas. Um, so um, tremendous results. They were very happy and it kind of unblocked a lot of their, uh, a lot of their internal processes and, and kind of, yeah, I mean, they were, they were happy. Um, th there's also another, another interesting use case that's kind of emerged where um, companies migrating from one system to another uh, have kind of started adopting Modin um, to, to help with that process. So if, if so Modin can basically uh, push queries down to, to both of these systems. So it's just a matter of switching a knob in, in Modin um, when you want to migrate rather than having to spend, you know, thousands of human hours rewriting every script to make sure that it's pointing at the right data source and that sort of thing. So, um, so we, we've had some, uh, some, some pretty good success with um, you know folks just dropping Modin in and and having it just kind of alleviate a lot of their problems. Um, and so the the last thing that I kind of want to highlight is uh, another interesting thing is that a lot of folks are like bringing their own database, their own SQL layer or or, or something like that, and um, kind of plugging it in underneath of Modin. We even have folks who um, we're bringing in graph database. So like to have a pandas run on top of their graph database. So um, if, you, if you are one of these folks, talk to me, please. Um, I, I'd love to hear from you. Um, but, but yeah, that's, uh, that's another really interesting use case because you know, it, it kind of unlocks the pandas user group um, you know, for your database. Okay, so um, this is, this has been great. I really appreciate all your attention. Um, I spent a lot of time on formalism and I got pretty deeply technical, so thank you so much for your attention. I don't get a lot of opportunity to kind of talk about my PhD work and, and that sort of thing, and I, and I hope you all took something away from it. Um, so we built this, this system, Modin, and we, and we did it by trying to kind of rethink the data frame. It's, it's always very tempting to kind of try to chip away at, at 
kind of the, the things that we know how to parallelize well or try to, you know, only focus on a subset or say that pandas is bad, but pandas isn't going anywhere. And so, you know, what we, what we really sought to do is kind of take this pandas community and just empower them and, and, and not tell them that they're wrong, not tell them that they need to change. And, um, and so, yeah, that's, um, that's it. And there's a lot of deep technical problems that still exist, a lot of interesting stuff going on, a lot of interesting stuff coming from Ponder in the next year. So, you know, stay tuned and, and yeah. Anyway, um, thank you. And thank you for putting up with my water antics. That was like not scripted, but. <laughs>